Hello and welcome to Gardener's World. Thanks for joining me again. Now, tonight is incredibly special for me because we have the grandfather of all the people that wrote all these books. Um, any big names you can think of, they're all influenced by this man. So I am honoured and humbled to have him on the show. Now, a long time ago, H.G. Wells, the famous science fiction writer, said that we neglect to teach our children about philosophy. We teach them about the philosopher. We tell him where he came from, um, when he lived, but we don't teach the children about the philosophy. We don't teach them how to think, how to broaden their horizons. And it's a little bit like giving a nurse or a doctor a, a drug, a new drug, um, telling them what it's called and where it came from, but not what to use it for. The guest tonight, Colin Wilson, is a man who has written so many books which tells us all about philosophy, which helps us to open our mind to think in a, in a better way. And he's been highly influential um, to me in particular, so I'm honoured and humbled to have Colin Wilson on the show tonight with his new book, Super Consciousness, which is all about the peak experience, something that, that a lot of people talk about and write about and think about in their own unique ways. But this book, I sat up till one o'clock this morning reading, and it's just a tremendous book, and it's, it's, it's a book we've all got to read if we're going to re truly understand what this is all about, the peak experience. So, Colin Wilson, thank you. I am humbled and honoured, sir, that you have joined me on this show. Now, tell us about this book, Super Consciousness. Well, it's basically about an American psychologist called Abraham Maslow, who um, was uh, the head of the American Psychological Association, and therefore believed in Freud, but got more and more sick of Freud because he said that um, Freud just talked about negative things and that in fact um, most sick people talked about nothing but their sickness yeah. and that he got bored with this. And so he got the interesting idea of asking around to find healthy people and he would ask people, who's the healthiest person you know? And they'd tell him. He got a list of healthy people, you know, about a hundred or so and then he tried studying them instead and he quickly discovered something that no one had ever discovered before because no one had thought of studying healthy people. And that was that all healthy people had with a fair degree of frequency what Maslow called peak experiences, just sudden bubbling experiences of sheer happiness. Mm. And uh, once uh, this had happened, of course, the question was, why did it happen? And can we make it happen again? Yeah. So. When I got this letter from him, I found it fascinating. And I said, well, how do you induce peak experiences? Mm. And he said, well, unfortunately, I can't tell you that. Right. They come when they want to, and they go when they want to, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So this seemed to me to be um, rather sad, until he said something that suddenly told me the answer to the question I just asked him. He said that he began talking to his students about peak experiences and that the students began remembering peak experiences they'd had in the past and that they'd more or less forgotten at the time. And then they began reca recalling them again and talking to one another about them. Mm. And as soon as the students began talking to one another about their peak experiences, they began having peak That's experiences happen. all the time. Right. So he'd found the method, in fact, of having the peak experience. It's kind of talking it up. <laughs> well, you focus upon it, yeah. and that's the main thing, focusing upon it. Mm. And uh, uh, the kind of thing that um, impressed Maslow, one of the students um, was working his way through college as a jazz drummer, mm. and one morning he said <clears throat> something like three, three in the morning, he was drumming in a nightclub, and suddenly he could not do a thing wrong and he went into the peak yeah. experience. Yeah. And he said that all of them had similar experiences. The, and the most uh, interesting of them was a young mother who was giving breakfast to her husband and kids. And suddenly a beam of sunlight came in through the window. And she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky? And went into the peak experience. Mm. The peak experience is basically the feeling, God, aren't I lucky? Right. And it can occur in all kinds of ways, but what, it, what happens in every case, is that you some, simply become conscious 
of something that was there before, because she was lucky before she thought, God, aren't I lucky? Yeah, yeah, sure. And it was suddenly, as it were, putting two cameras on you being lucky yeah. instead of just one she of them. She was kind of self-aware of the fact. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for example, uh, there was a Marine who came back um, from the South Seas after spending God knows how many years without ever seeing a woman. And when he came back and saw a nurse back at base, he went into the peak experience. Not anything to do with sex, but because he said, it suddenly hit him, women are different from men. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, we think of women as another kind of man, in a way, another kind of human being. But they're not they're as different from uh, men as horses are from cows. Mm. And he said, you know, it suddenly hits you in this powerful way. Right. Now, that is the peak experience, and it's what happens in all good thinking when suddenly something becomes absolutely clear to you. Yeah. So you, have you ever had the peak experience once well, or twice? Uh, yeah. Well, it's not just once or twice. You see, I got interested in the whole thing simply because um, peak experiences have been something, fortunately, which have happened fairly frequently in my life. But mostly... I noticed them as a child at Christmas. Everybody does at Christmas. They get into this, this lovely state mm. in which everything seems wonderful. And, of course, the one thing you would love to do is to be able to reproduce them at other times of the year. And this yeah. is the most difficult thing of all. Yeah. This is what got me so interested in peak experiences. So as soon as I saw Maslow talking about peak experiences, something went ping, and I thought, this is what I've been looking for for mm. so long. Mm. So would you relate it at all to religious experience? Um, well, it's a kind of religious experience, all right, but um, it's not necessarily um, an experience of anything to do with conventional religion. What seems to happen is that you suddenly discover the reality of things. Aldous Huxley discovered it when he took the drug mescaline for the first time, mm. and he said that quite suddenly, looking at anything made him aware of the immense reality of what he was looking at. So that looking at a deck chair made of red and yellow stripes, it seemed to be made of red and yellow fire. Right. And he said everything was like this. He'd look at a table like this one we're sitting at, and simply the light reflecting off the table would strike him as so immensely real mm. that it was the only important thing in the universe. Mm. Now, that is the essence of the peak experience, but of course the peak experience is just basically that sudden feeling of overwhelming happiness. Right. Do people have a, a sense of connection at all to the universe? To, do they get into a state where it's like a nexus, they want to get back to that point? Well, yes, um, you can do. And, um, in fact, uh, one writer about all this called it cosmic consciousness. And what happened in the case of this chap, whose name was Richard Morris Buck, is that um, round about 1900, he'd spent an evening sitting with friends reading their favourite poetry, which included Walt Whitman and, you know, Keats and Shelley and all mm. the rest of it. Uh, and incidentally, Walt Whitman was actually there. And at the end of the evening, he went out and got into a carriage to take him home when he suddenly thought that there was a fire somewhere, a sort of red glow, and he thought, uh-uh, what's going on? Mm. And then looked around and realised that actually the fire was inside himself. And uh, this got him so interested because he thought, there's obviously another type of consciousness completely, mm. a higher level of consciousness, um, which makes us see things completely differently. And th this he called cosmic consciousness. In other words, you're not just conscious of what's going on around you at the moment. You're, uh, this level of consciousness is as much above ordinary human consciousness as human being, human consciousness is above ordinary animal yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Um, now, what a lot of people may be pointing to today is saying the next step in evolution. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this was, is something that I came to believe quite early on, long before I'd come across Maslow. I was giving a talk um, to the Shaw Society in London round about 1957, just after my first book, The Outsider, came out. And... Uh, Somebody asked me a question about consciousness, <clears throat> and I said, I believe that man is on the point of a leap in consciousness to a higher phase. Right. Then I found myself thinking, <laughs> do I really mean that, <laughs> or did I just say it for effect? And I thought about it and thought, no, I really mean it. Mm. And it was sort of like a sudden insight. But these things don't occur to you as flashes of, um, you know, brilliant... Uh, 
knowledge they just suddenly occur as a precise and absolute intellectual focus. Mm. It's the kind of thing Sherlock Holmes could have, yeah. as well as anybody else. Right, sort of kind of in intuitive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's what interested me so much, how you could actually teach yourself um, to focus the mind sufficiently to get mm. peak experiences. Yeah, because this book is very much a, a kind of self-help to how to get there, isn't it? Mm. You know, I mean... The reason I ask about the religious experience, maybe even the mystical experience, you know, that point where they get a sense of the divine, where they see a greater knowledge, they, they believe they're part of the whole universe and maybe even connect to the whole knowledge of the universe. But it's, it's not the same kind of knowledge that you get out of a book. And you, you know, it's, it's a different kind of knowledge. And there's this sense that they want to go back. So, you know, it, from a religious context, it could also be dangerous, couldn't it? Um, it could be, but in fact, what tends to happen is that we, what we, the discovery we make um, in such moments is that consciousness can be expanded so that it tends to be almost like a series of reflections in a mirror. Mm -hmm. In the way that if you let off um, a flare in a room full of mirrors, and then got them bouncing back from every point of the room, so to speak. This is rather what it's like. Mm. Um, and this is um, the fascinating thing about cosmic consciousness, that you actually recognize that it's something to do um, with, a, a, just rec with, with just feeling yourself um, to be a different person than you ever knew before. Mm. It's like recognizing, seeing yourself for the first time. Almost like finding the true self. <laughs> that well, they're yes, told about. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, does this make any, any differences in the outside world? You know, does it make any external influences? Does it change anything for people, other than their own actions, maybe, causing those reactions? Well, the, that brings me to an interesting point about this. Whenever I've succeeded in pushing myself by some kind of mental effort um, closer to the peak experience, what tends to happen um, is what Jung called synchronicities. Right. And this um, always happens again and again. So that when I started observing this once, I was writing an article about synchronicity um, for an encyclopedia. And as I was writing the article, I came across an example in, um, about Joan of Arc. And then within minutes looking in something else, came across another example about Joan of Arc. <laughs> and from then on, it just went on expanding until I was coming across uh, example after example of synchronicity. Mm. Now, um, the interesting thing was, some of these things were so extreme, so extraordinary, that it was impossible to believe that they were merely coincidence. Mm. I mean, to, to explain to people who don't really know about Jung and don't know that, that he's, oh. he's the guy who, who coined synchronicity, if you like, um, what, what is synchronicity as opposed to coincidence? Ah, well, what Jung actually um, recognised was that suddenly um, the same type of thing tends to happen over and over again. <clears throat> so that um, he'd heard a whole series of comments about um, this, uh, a particular kind of fish, and then a little later on the same morning from a completely different patient, another thing about the same fish until suddenly it began to strike him that someone was trying to tell him something and that what was trying to tell him something was a, almost as it were fate. Mm. And it's the repetition of this that's so interesting. Mm. Now, um, an American uh, I know called Jacques Vallée, a Frenchman who went to America and got very interested in flying saucers, UFOs. And he also quickly noticed this business about the coincidence or the synchronicity, although they tend to happen again and again. What interested him so much, he said, was that it's almost as if you, um, you had a different system um, of classifying things, rather like a librarian. A librarian, for example, would normally classify things under alphabetical order. And so that if you wanted to find out where some particular book was, you'd simply look it up in the catalogue under the author. 
and then going and looking it up in the catalogue. But there must be a simpler way of doing that, particularly nowadays when we've got um, so much electronic help. Mm. And what um, Jacques suggested was supposing whenever a book came into the library, you simply shoved it on the first shelf and allowed the shelves to expand. But there's something on the back of every book that tells you precisely where it is. And all you have to do um, when you find some um, reference that you want and you want to get hold of the book is push a button and it goes beep, 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 beep on the back of a book and a little red light comes on. And uh, this would be obviously a different way of classifying things. Now, that was the idea of um, Jacques Vallée because he got fascinated by certain coincidences and synchronicities and uh, he thought there must be something more to all this. It's almost as if something outside us mm. is looking down at us and pushing the button at the right moment and making the beep, beep, beep go. Mm. And nearly all people who've experienced a series of synchronicities have had this same weird feeling of being almost picked up, so to speak, and made to look at something yeah. by force outside ourselves. Yeah. So there's no longer a feeling of, you know, merely our personal selves. Like a friend of mine said recently, it's like synchronicity dumping itself on you. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't avoid it. Everywhere he went, it was hitting him. That's right, That's yes. the kind of thing, mm. yeah. Well, um, in Jacques' case, um, what happened was to do with the biblical prophet called Melchizedek. Mm. And uh, he got very interested in this prophet, um, Melchizedek, but couldn't find a single thing about him. And so um, he looked him up everywhere he could. And then he got um, a taxi in Los Angeles, and his lady taxi driver, when he asked her for um, her name because he wanted a receipt from her, said her name was Melchizedek. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jacques thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, she gave him this receipt, M. Melchizedek. When he got back home, he thought, well, the Los Angeles must be full of Melchizedeks. Looked it up in the L.A. phone directory, which is this high. Yeah. One Melchizedek, his taxi driver. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, he was uh, fascinated by this apparent coincidence. Now, um, I happened to be writing about that. And I was writing an article, as I say, about synchronicity. And... Uh, it was getting late afternoon and I was yawning and it was time I took my dogs for a walk. As I got up to go upstairs to the sitting room, I saw lying around on the bed a book that I hadn't seen before, but I knew it was my book because I'd had it specially bound. And um, I thought, oh, that's interesting, and took it upstairs with me. It was a book called You Are Condemned to Life by a doctor called Chesney. Mm. And um, once I got upstairs, uh, once I came back from my walk, I opened this book, and the first thing I see is a headline saying, Cult of Melchizedek. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> my hair actually yeah. <laughs> made a funny little electrical feeling. Because <laughs> I suddenly thought, that's a real... It's almost as if someone was telling me about Jacques' um, coincidences oh. or Jacques' um, synchronicities, and said, you really want an example of synchronicity? Here's one. Oh. <laughs> and handed yeah. me this. I mean, I see it sometimes like, um, you know, when you're looking for a new car, um, you'll say, oh, I'll, I'll have one of these. And then suddenly as you're driving around, they're everywhere. It's, 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 it's like, one, you've opened your perceptions yeah. to these things. And so is it, is it like that? Is it, you know, in a universal scale, in a, in a psychological scale? It, have we opened our perceptions suddenly to these things? Or Well, you see, what's re really interesting is the fact that once you've opened your perceptions to it, it appears to operate on other people. Now, this is the external thing I was trying to get to. It's, yeah. It's, does it make, cause an effect with others too? That's what I mean. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. sort of, it goes like a flash of lightning all around the community. Yeah. Now, I knew about this because it happened to me when I published this first book, The Outsider, which was in 1956. I mean, something's just flashed in mind. You know, as, as a marketing guy, you kind of think to yourself, whoa, if this is true, just think of the marketing that you can do with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting a bunch of people sat together, all concentrating on a product, and synchronicities will occur, and everybody will buy that product. Well, <laughs> it depends upon the peculiar. What you, I'm sure that you could do this, in point of fact, get a group of people together. Uh, a peculiar kind of focus, a peculiar kind of intensity. You see, because I could see with the outsider that what had happened was that quite suddenly everybody was talking about outsiders. 
Unfortunately, um, it got completely derailed because John Osborne had written a play called Look Back in Anger, which came out the week before The Outsider. Right. The papers weren't sure whether to talk about outsiders or angry young men, and unfortunately, angry young men won out. Right. And so, what I felt in a way, you know, this, this project, I thought, my God, isn't it wonderful? You know, I'm like somebody who's sort of thrown a stone and has actually hit the bullseye the first time. Mm. And then the more time went by, I realized, no, nope, this is just not true. Unfortunately, um, difficulties are thrown in your way and the whole thing is made ten times as complicated as you think. Right. And that is what happened um, with The Outsider. So here I am, 50 years later, <laughs> and still with the same feeling that, uh, you know, Stick with it and something will happen. And the something that will happen is oddly sort of um, physical in a way. You see, we are apparently at the moment in a time of extraordinary crisis. Mm. Everything seems to be going wrong. And what this tells us, this whole business of synchronicity and um, of the peak experience, is that we can somehow change things. We can make things go right. Mm. How? Well, Maslow had got the answer. As soon as his students began to talk to one another about peak experiences, they began having peak experiences all the time. We'd rather interesting, and I've noticed this if I've talked ever in a lecture about peak experiences, the first thing I notice is that everybody in the audience begins to smile. <laughs> and uh, quite obviously, everybody recognizes the nature of the peak experience. The realization that, in point of fact, there is a possibility of making it such a general experience that is, it, were, it would go around the world, a change. Mm. We could change civilization. So let's we, start today. You know, all the yeah, people that are watching this show now, <laughs> can we make them all smile at home and with, send this around the world? With the simple idea, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of rather like Uri Geller, who used to do the same thing on television and make people bend spoons. Mm. This is a bit more useful. <laughs> yeah, rather. <than> that. <laughs> it's making people smile and let's send some positive waves out there because there's an awful lot of negatives, aren't there? There's, I mean, you, you're probably fully aware of the, the 2012 club, people going on about the Mayan prophecies and, hmm. and it's either the end of the world or it's a great enlightenment and we're all going to, you know, everything's going to be saved and it's all going to be fantastic. Let's go for a positive aspect and let's say that, that we can make a change now. Mm. Never mind 2012, never mind some silly date in the future or some date in the past or whatever. Let's make a change now and let's all have this positive experience and peak experience now and then spread that to our family and our friends and, you know, is this, is this, this a good thing? Should we do this? Um, it could be done and what's more, uh, I've been saying that it could be done for 50 years or so. <laughs> and uh, I'm finding it increasingly difficult in a certain sense because um, you see, I found myself born in a very negative time, mm. a time of negative philosophy. This negative philosophy had been around, in fact, since around about uh, right after the First World War, mm. when quite suddenly um, it invaded literature in the form of things like T.S. Eliot's Way to Land and Ernest Hemingway's early yeah. novels, and this feeling, you know, that um, quite suddenly the world is, you know, in Noel Coward's cavalcade, <laughs> a voice towards the end keeps shouting, the world's gone mad, the world's gone <laughs> yes, mad. Yes. And uh, this kind of thing does produce a, a reflection mm. in the society itself. Mm. So if you really want to destroy things, just go around shouting the world's gone mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all going to end. <laughs> yeah. So can, can peak experiences be used in a positive way, for instance, with people who are neurotic or, or have other mental ailments? Oh, very much indeed. I mean, for example, um, a, a friend I knew, an older chap, came over to see me one day years ago and said, could I offer him some kind of work? And he said it didn't matter whether I paid him or not. All that he wanted was that he was in such a miserable state that um, he uh, would do anything, you know, just for the sake of putting his mind on something else. And I said, well, I can't actually because I tend to write most of my own stuff and it pours straight onto the typewriter. We didn't have a computer then. Mm. And... Uh, Anyway, I Good said... Good old days. Sorry? Good old days. <laughs> yeah, yes. Sir. And uh, I said, it, but um, here's my latest book, you know, have a look at this. And I passed on a book called New Pathways in Psychology, which was about Abraham Maslow and peak experiences. Mm. And he came back the following week and said, ah, you bugger, you knew what you were doing, didn't you, when you gave me that book? And it, oh, it's quite obviously changed, you know, from being miserable and gloomy, yeah. quite suddenly it had changed yeah. 
So the very fact of actually looking into this? It's merely a matter of becoming conscious of something. Mm. I mean, would you have any advice if there are people out there now watching this that are uh, maybe negative about certain things or, or feeling a bit low about things and maybe wondering to themselves, well, what is this peak experience? How can I achieve this? Well, yes, but um, what you've got to do is to start off by understanding the way that all this has come about because that's the really interesting question. That's what I've really gone into in this book. Mm. The way that ever since um, round about... Um, 1873 or something, uh, there has been an increasing tendency to this extreme gloom. And it really, the Romantics started this whole idea of getting these ecstatic, wonderful feelings that the whole world is a marvelous place. You know, and Keats and Shelley and all the rest, and William Blake. And then quite suddenly, around about 1830, it went out like a light. With, partly with the death of Byron and various others. Mm. But quite suddenly, Romanticism uh, turned into something rather bitter and grim and continued in that way um, for the rest of the century and has continued right down until today. Mm. So what we're doing in a way is trying to change something that has been around um, for well over 200 years. Now, um, I've often felt as a writer that this is like some enormous log which lies across the road of civilization. Mm. And that we can't go forward with this log in the way. What we've got to do is to get a bulldozer and bulldoze it out of the way. Yeah. And then everything would be fine. Right. And uh, I've always believed in this. And I've also recognized that, you know, there's nobody who can do it if, if I don't get the bulldozer mm. and start work on it. You see, you've got to start understanding the way that these things work. What it amounts to is really what I call the Laurel and Hardy theory of consciousness. And what this involves recognizing is that inside you've got two different beings that you could compare to Laurel and Hardy. You know, um, Hardy is the fat one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Stan, I'm old enough to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Stan's the, the thin one. Yeah. And uh, what, what actually happens is that you have two people living inside your brain, mm. inside the right and left hemispheres of your brain, who correspond pretty exactly to Laurel and Hardy. Mm. Uh, and what happens when you get into these states of extreme happiness is that Laurel and Hardy are actually reinforcing one another. And so that when a child, for example, gets terribly happy on Christmas morning, what happens is something like this. The child wakes up and um, thinks, oh, good, it's Christmas. And then everything tends to reinforce that feeling, oh, good. You know, the lights on the Christmas tree, mm. the smell of the turkey cooking in the oven, the mince pies, and all the rest of it. And so you can, before the end of Christmas Day, build yourself up into a state of optimism mm. that seems absolutely unattackable. Whereas what has actually happened in this civilization, as I say, since about um, 1770, is that we've gone in the opposite direction and tended to go down and down and down. Mm. Now, um, once you recognize that, in fact, what you've got are two people in your brain, um, Stan and Ollie, and that once uh, you recognize it, there are some mornings when things seem to go wrong, you know, um, and Ollie, who is the intellectual of the two in a way, let's say he cuts himself while shaving, and then, you know, he, going out of the front door, falls over the doorstep and all the rest of it. And he thinks, oh, God, it's just one of those days. As soon as you think, oh, God, it's just one of those it's days. It's going to be one of those days. Uh, stuff's yeah. going wrong. Oh, well. yeah. A man uh, called Raymond Dart, who was um, a naturalist, was talking um, with a man called Robert Ardrey, um, who was also very interested in the subject, they went past a branch that uh, appeared to have an extremely beautiful um, flower on the branch. Dart waved his hand over this branch, which immediately dis dissolved into a little flight of tiny flies which buzzed all around the place. Then they all resettled on this branch, which actually proved to be a completely dead piece of wood, crawled over one another's backs and formed on the branch an absolutely perfect um, flower, 
which was green at the tip as it would be, and so on. <laughs> and all of the rest looked absolutely marvellous. Yeah. And uh, now, I asked um, Julian Huxley, who's a biologist, yeah. um, what, um, how this could happen in the evolutionary sense. And he said he didn't know, he couldn't see any possible mechanism that would enable a whole colony of yeah. these things. Yeah. You see, evolution happens in the sense of individuals. Yeah. You know, a giraffe strives hard, uh, harder and harder, and it's supposed to generate a longer neck. But it's just an individual giraffe. Mm. You can't, if you've got a whole colony of a thousand sort of little insects, suddenly turn them into a perfect mm. plant. There's some connection somewhere, isn't there? There's a rather weird connection, yeah. yes. Yeah. And it's, it's as if there's some kind of lord of the ants or of mm. the flies or whatever. Mm we're looking at. Some kind of overarching frequency ratio, whatever you want to yep. call it, that, that, that pulls all these things together. That's right. In, yeah. And what we've got to do in some funny way is to tune in. And that's peak experience, frequency. isn't it? It's kind of tuning in to yep. this greater thing, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, this greater frequency. I mean, at the end of the day, thoughts are frequencies, aren't they? They're waveforms. <laughs> you see, I think, as far as I'm concerned, my great advantage has always been that I've been a very cheerful kind of individual. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so you've uh, had many peak experiences. Yeah. So Could you tell us about one of them? Um, well, um, I can certainly tell you about the way that I've noticed the way that um, it appears to happen. Um, one evening, my wife and I were driving back home from the local pub, and... Uh, where we used to go and have a sort of glass of wine and a sandwich at about six o'clock. And I said to her, you know, we take it for granted this car will get us home and that everything will be okay, but we don't really bother to think that things could go wrong. And as I began to say this to her, the car went slower and slower and slower, and it stopped. <laughs> and so I got out and sort of lifted up the bonnet and poked around and all the rest of it. Couldn't see anything at all wrong with it. And finally, another car came along the road, and I signalled him to a stop and said, would he give my wife a lift home? And uh, because he was going that way, and off he went with her. And uh, I stayed on. She came back in due course with our Land Rover and some thick ropes, and we hauled the car along home. Yeah. Well, when the garage looked at it on the following Monday morning, they said, it's funny, we've never seen this fault before. <laughs> it's a completely rare thing. Right. But as far as I was concerned, I could see that the words I'd said to her, we take it for granted that this car will get us home, but perhaps it won't. Mm. And it was as if as it were, someone overheard me, said, OK, we'll demonstrate it. Mm. And what it demonstrated for me, of course, because there was no real damage done, we were home a mere 20 minutes later than we would have been normally, yeah. what it merely demonstrated was that there appears to be some force in the universe which does take notice of these kind of things, you can actually change them. Mm. Now, now that we're living in this particular time when it looks as if things are incredibly bad, I've got a feeling once again that if, in fact, this could be grasped, we could, as it were, generate a whole movement mm. where we could do it with our minds alone. Mm. And, of course, someone like you is in an ideal position to do it because you exercise such influence over so many people. Well, <laughs> not the wife. <laughs> but I do, I do agree. I think it's time, personally, you know, I, mean, I, I veer away from giving personal opinions or try to, but my personal opinion is that it's time for a big moral shift. Mm. You know, that we've, we've allowed people, and we've allowed concepts such as greed, etc., to have too much of a hold on us as a society as a whole. And it's time to start listening maybe to that true self that we were talking about earlier, the intuitive side of ourselves. What do you think? Do you think it's time to get back to this utopian idea? Yep, I, I fortunately have never been terribly involved in that because uh, as a writer, I've never made much money. I was being so <laughs> a surprise, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore, you know, it's, uh, oh, I've always had an overdraft. I haven't got one at the moment, believe it or not, mm. but um, we've always had an overdraft and um, we take it for granted that things will work out OK. Mm. And it's, I'm sure this basic belief that things will work out OK, yeah. that's, the, um, that's the answer to this. Right. Indeed. Fascinating. I mean, there's, there's obviously there are waves and peaks and troughs of, of, of feel-good factors. I mean, you know, America yeah. with Obama, 
coming in has got this little wave of a feel-good factor going off. But mm. there's also a negative side to it. I mean, you know, anybody who sees on YouTube and sees the uh, film The Obama Deception that's doing the rounds, yep. you know, already that opposite side of the coin, that Laurel and Hardy, mm. in the society is coming out. So do you think, I mean, my point I'm trying to make is what's going off in the individual? Do you think that's reflected in the society as a whole, like the, the bugs that turn in, that make the flower? I, I, is that the same kind of connection there? Well, I'm absolutely certain that there um, is a force outside us that causes the bugs to turn into flowers, and that um, our main problem has for, for a very long time um, been to believe in this and to recognise its existence. Mm. It began to happen um, in the 19th century with this movement called Romanticism, and it had gone dead by the end of the century, and everyone was in a sort of mood of utter gloom, and then it went worse and worse and worse with the First World War, and then, as I say, Hemingway and the Wasteland and all the rest of it. Mm. And now, as far as I can see, philosophy has never been in such a totally gloomy state oh, yes. as it is <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I, mu I must admit, I agree with you. I mean, I, I interviewed a, a philosopher not long ago, um, quite a leading philosopher, I'm not going to mention his name, but um, we've got that in the can. And I came away from that gloomy. Mm. I was, you know, if I had to sit there all day thinking those thoughts, I might as well do what a lot of people that you've spoken of in, the, in your book, <laughs> kill myself. Mm. You know, oh, well, it's, none of it's worth anything, it's all a waste of time, etc., etc. You know, philosophy to me is getting people to actually think for themselves, not telling them to start thinking gloomy thoughts. You know, um, well, but what do we mean by self? Do you have a, an opinion on what the true self is? Well, um, when I started writing The Outsider, it was partly because I was fascinated by the suicide rate in the yeah. 19th century, that so many people had killed themselves. And then when you looked at it more closely, you could suddenly see that the reason the suicide rate was so high was that you got a particular kind of conflict. Van Gogh, um, painted a picture called The Starry Night, yeah. which shows the whole sky exploding yeah. with stars all over the place. There's such insight in that yeah. painting, isn't there? And it seems yeah. to be absolutely positive. And yet, six months later, he killed himself yeah. and left behind a note that read, misery will never end. Well, it's perfectly obvious that it was Van Gogh who, in a way, decided that misery will never end. Mm. And what's more, if the silly sod had hung on for another <laughs> year, Everything began to change. Yeah. So it there's a good message for everybody, though. Isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant message. Mm. You know, we're all capable of doing such wonderful things, like Van Gogh, who, who did some tremendous paintings with a lot of depth to them. Um, but then can also flip to the other side. And we've all got to be careful to keep the positive going as well. Do you think? Yep, I've always recognised this um, this fact that it depends upon one's own mind and also upon, as you say, tuning in um, to a feeling of positiveness um, in the time that you're living. You know, it's actually around us in a way. Uh, it's in the air. Mm. And um, it's not sort of too difficult to do. Years ago, I began doing it on long train journeys, putting myself into this state of mind and deliberately keeping it going and seeing how long it could be kept going for. Well, um, I'm nearly 88 at the moment. No, I'm not in 78. And uh, years of doing this have gradually taught me the way to do it. Mm. And I'm convinced that this is the basic answer. <laughs> it's possible, of course, to be wrong about that. <laughs> Bernard Shaw said that um, he believed he was well on the way to living to be 300, which was always my ambition. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, he died at 93. That's not bad. No, no, that's, that's really pretty good. In fact, I would be fairly satisfied. I'd be satisfied to get to, to 78. <laughs> I'd be yeah. satisfied to get to 40 in a few days. But we've got less than a minute. Do you have one final message that you'd like the people to take home? Um, only that basically... Um, free will actually does exist, and that um, the reason that you rec recognise this is that whenever you are forced to do something with a certain determination, you can suddenly become aware of a feeling inside yourself of freedom.
Mm. Freedom is something that you can increase um, by simply concentrating hard and expanding it quite deliberately. Mm. And um, I've always found, you know, that if I get into these negative states, it's quite easy. There we go. Fantastic. We got right up to the last second yet again. Join me again on Gardener's World when we'll have some more fantastic guests. Hello there and welcome to Gardener's World. Now recently we had um, Professor Hugh Montgomery on the show talking about bloodlines and specifically bloodline of Jesus, um, a bunch known as the Ulvunga dynasty. Um, the Jesus link isn't necessarily important in this respect, but they certainly claim descent from people like Odin, the god. Now it was fascinating um, but what's happened is I've had an awful lot of emails and people contacted me asking me to have you back on because they didn't feel that they'd got enough information. So we have you back on again. Uh, it's Professor Hugh Montgomery. He's an historian, uh, professor of uh, audiology, I think his PhD was in audiology, and a number of other things. And his books are all about the God Kings. This is God Kings of England, um, the God Kings of Europe, which I think was the first one. And his very latest book, which um, recently hit the newspapers, and here he is in the press, having to go at the Da Vinci Code yet again. So, this is his new book, The God Kings of Utrema. So, we shall find out all about this new book now with my special guest, Hugh Montgomery. Thank you very much for coming on the show again. Thank you very much indeed for, being for having put me. Again. Through it twice. Yes, I know. <laughs> most people, most people only endure torture the once and then run a mile. But you've come back for right. more. I'm a bit of a masochist. You're a masochist. Yeah. Okay, that's no problem. Well, they're like that on this show. This, this is a your third in the series, yep. and I believe the last. Yes. Which is a sorrowful thing for those of us that have enjoyed it. Um, but I know that there are other things afoot anyway. Yep. So. God Kings of Utrema. First of all, what is Utrema? Utrema simply means over the sea, mm. and it is the name by which um, Palestine, Syria, the, king, the Crusader kingdoms, if you like, and were known to the Western Knights. Mm. They simply said it was Utrema over the sea, but that's what they meant when they talked about Utrema. Right, and it's simple as that. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So, really, God Kings. Yep. It's a strange title, you know, it's kings that are gods, yes. or claim to be gods. Yep. Um, for those people who didn't see the first time that mm -hmm. we were on, or don't know about the books, um, what are the god kings? Are they all based around a certain dynasty, the Ulvunga, as, you, as you've named them. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, but the idea of the god kings comes a bit further back than that. It actually goes back to the Kassite dynasty of Mesopotamia, okay. who were like the pharaohs, who were gods on earth, they were the god kings. Yeah. So the um, Kassite dynasty, well in fact all the dynasties of Mesopotamia were also god kings, they represented the god on earth. Mm -hmm. Most people will know this is like Babylon. That yes, kind of uh, Babylon, exactly yeah. so, yeah. yeah. And um, the last three but one of the dynasty of the Kassites were called something or other Edina. Okay. Which from means... Edina you get Odin, you get Ewin, you get Wotan. It's basically the same word and it simply means the one. That's all it means. Isn't that an incredible title to give your god king? The, the one. one. Yeah. Well, when, when we're told away. that you guess, know, guess what? <laughs> you know yeah. this is the idea of the one god yeah. goes back an awful long way. Well that's the point I was just yeah. about to make. You know, we're told that, that monotheism <laughs> didn't really arrive until Christianity and that maybe maybe Akhenaten introduced a little bit of that with his solar worship, etc. Hmm. Um, and yet you're here pointing out how far before? Well, the Kassite dynasty, um, the first of the Adenas was I think about 1,150 BC, roughly. So quite a time before. Quite a time. Well, no, actually, uh, it's it's slightly after the Akhenaten one, funnily enough, mm. because it was probably in the reign. I'm trying to think who the Egyptians would have been at the time. Ramesses the second, I guess, or Seti the first, right. or Seti the second. So um, predates the Akhenaten solar worship concept. Mm. Post-states it. Post-states it, Post states, yeah. Um, was it influenced at all by you? I've got no idea. No idea. I've got no idea. All I would say is that we do know that the Kassite dynasty and the dynasty of the pharaonic 
um, dynasty of, of, of Egypt intermarried. Right. In other words, daughters of one were given to, as, as wives of, of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughters were given as, as wives to the... To so the, the god kings of both lands... Were certainly interlinked in okay. one shape or form. In or bloodlines. Yes. Yeah. Um, and right, okay. So, so we start out with these god kings, which yeah. are, are That's basically where the called the one from. god. Yeah. Um, and, and where do we go from there? Well, basically, how did they get from there to? Uchi? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what actually happens is that um, a plague, a hemorrhagic plague, swept through Babylon. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, by the very nature of the god kingship, if you like, if the god was no longer with you, and he put a plague upon you, you had to leave, you had to get out. Right. Either that or you'd someone cut your throat. Mm -hmm. And um, so what actually happened was that this plague was called the Hand of Marduk. And it's well documented in cuneiform writing mm -hmm. and script and so on. Marduk being one of the... One, Marduk being the main god of Babylon. Yeah. Right. Okay. This is the one with the wing... This kind of the image of Marduk is the one with the great big wings on the back, is that right? That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, no, I think that's actually a Syrian. Is it? Yes. Okay. No, I think, uh, I meant, Marduk probably didn't have, did have wings as well, but I can't remember off. I seem to remember some yeah, relationships you, you, and being avenging age or... You may well kind. be right. Mm. You may well be right. Um, it, he, I wasn't particularly interested in Marduk. That is not. Yeah, so <laughs> I hand up my hand and say, well, I don't know. Okay, so this hand of this avenging age yeah. old Marduk, boy, comes along. Yeah, and, and basically, he, he, as far as they were concerned, God was responsible for everything. He was responsible for your well-being. He was responsible for death. He was responsible for being born. He was responsible for health, everything else. Mm -hmm. So, if something like this happened, this was the hand of Marduk. Right. And that's what it was called in the ancient um, cuneiform writings. So, they had to leave. So, they left with their servants and cattle and all the rest of it and trekked northwards. And we know certain places where they finished up. Yeah. Um, the main place that they finished up was in Scandinavia, in particularly the sort of southern Scandinavia, uh, what is today sort of more or less Sweden, Ostrogotland, um, Vestergotland, and the, the island of Gotland. Mm -hmm. Very important names. Precisely, because if you think about it, all that means is the lands of the gods. Absolutely, yeah. Now, why were they the lands of the gods? Because, um, okay, it took them 600 years, perhaps, maybe a bit longer, yeah. to get from, from Babylon to Scandinavia. And that's provable. It's provable by a number of things. One, there are two stone inscriptions, which actually says, so, you know, Joe Bloggs was here. The Cassites were here. Right. Um, uh, one of which is, is um, now in the Aberdeen Museum. Mm -hmm. And also because of a particular mutation. That mutation is known as CCR5 Delta 32. Um, we know that it occurred in this particular group of people round about 1100 BC. Right. Okay? There is scientific evidence for that. There is. Um, uh, there's, there's been an enormous amount of scientific research on this mm -hmm. because of this hemorrhagic plague. Because yeah. what happened is that this particular mutation made them immune to the plague. Okay? Right. So... You would appear as God, wouldn't you? Well, absolutely. Mm. Particularly, particularly when some years after they had got there and established themselves, a new hemorrhagic plague swept through, which is called the Black Death, except that everyone says it's a bubonic plague. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. Yeah. It was actually a hemorrhagic plague. And there's a lot of scientific literature in, in mm -hmm. neuroscience magazines and so on about it. And um, they were found to be immune. And what did the Icelandic say of them? They said, these Sumerians, and that's what they call them, these Sumerians are blessed by the gods. Well, of course they were, mm -hmm. because they were, they, they, they were immune to this plague. Well, this is the bit that I always found fascinating, yeah. is, that, is that this bloodline, these yeah. special god kings, yeah. um, for whatever reason they're special, there is a special reason. The fact that they are immune to this hemorrhagic plague. Yeah, yeah. Which is now, I, you know, there are arguments as to whether or not everybody is immune to it, or only 
how it is passed down. In other words, my understanding, and please, I am not an expert on DNA, I'm not an expert on, on, on you know, mutations, mm -hmm. um, and I don't pretend to be, so I have to go by what other people tell me. But my understanding is that it is a male dominant system which is passed down to a particular male in line, and if he uh, is immune, then his children have got 50 50 chance of being it. If one of them isn't, then they won't be immune. Yeah. I think that it, that's my understanding. But so you know, it can become negative, but yeah, exactly. But it can carry yeah. on too. Yeah. So that's my understanding of it. But there would said, be a really good reason for keeping that bloodline alive, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. It's a very protective reason, if you like. <laughs> well, let's face it. If you were a woman, you'd want to. You <laughs> you you'd want your sons yeah. or your daughters to be immune too, wouldn't mm, you? Mm. So what would you do? Throw yourself at him, I assume. <laughs> and th this can kind of link to all the things that we were talking about over dinner yesterday. <laughs> uh, about this first night thing. This yeah, well, I mean, you have this... Um... Everybody's seen Braveheart. Let me just explain. Everybody's seen Braveheart, haven't they? Uh, uh, anybody oh, who hasn't okay. seen Braveheart, you've got to watch it, because it's, you know... <laughs> even though it's historically a load of... Balderdash, yeah. yes. <laughs> Balderdash, that's what I was going to say. Yes. <laughs> It, there are things in there, you know, that, that Longshanks, Lang, Longshanks introduced into Scotland, this first, or reintroduced, supposedly, this first night thing where um, the ladies have to, on the first night of marriage, have to be given over to... Their lord. Their lord. <coughs> for that night. I mean, that's going to annoy anybody. That was the whole idea of introducing it into the film. But the point is it wasn't no, necessarily like the fact, the fact of the matter is almost exactly the opposite. Mm. Um, the fact of the matter was that... If you were, um, let us say, the, you know, you were a peasant girl, right? And you were going to be married off to another peasant. And you thought, well, what is going to happen to my children? Now, I have an opportunity mm. of having at least one child. A well, godchild. Who, yes, if you like, who is yeah. a godchild, call them whatever you yeah. like. Yeah. But <clears throat> who will have this immunity? Yeah. Now, Let's understand it. They didn't think like that. They didn't know about this immunity. All they knew is that these people survived plagues. Mm. They didn't know why. It was this was God. Mm. You know, they were gods. They were they were very special. They were royal. They, they were, were called lords. Yeah, exactly. The the day, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and this was what it was all about. And so it was them who actually said, "Well, excuse me, my husband to be. <laughs> you know, I want to spend one night with my lord. I have a, hopefully." Uh, the first con conception I have will be by him. Mm -hmm. And a boy. And a boy. Yeah. So there's a lot of reasons there, isn't it? I mean, there's one particular re big reason for, firstly, why people would like a, a boy <coughs> yep. to start with. Yes. Know, there, apart from the other standard reasons yep. that people are. That completely throws this first night thing into a new light. Um, but also, <coughs> it gives us a good reason as to why the bloodline is so important. Yes. That, that is something that is missing completely from films like Bloodline and from The Da Vinci Code and no. nobody even thinks about that kind no, of stuff. It's all absolutely. about, oh, why it's so special because it's Jesus. No, forget it. We don't even know whether Jesus was of that line no. at all. But we're here, we have a particularly important yeah. and incredibly scientific yeah. reason, no. which is provable. Well, it's, it, let's put it like this. It's there, it is a fact, yeah. and what is more, we know that as the Vikings came down into Europe, um, what the Christians would call raping and pillaging, um, <laughs> they brought that with them. And all of, a um, lot of the Viking descendants, there's been a big DNA study done by um, King's College London, showing that almost all of these descendants on the male line have got CCR5.32. Never. That's profound, isn't it, really? Well, I don't know it's profound. It's a fact. Have you been tested? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I may run out tomorrow. <laughs> yes, well, uh, I don't know. No, I haven't. But funny, the funny thing about it is that one of the people who's doing this is actually also called Human Cymru. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. Seriously. <laughs> he's, he's a doctor, Human Cymru, he's a professor, Human Cymru, and he's a professor of, I don't know, neuroscience uh, or something. There's Human Cymru's everywhere. Oh, I know there are. So, <laughs> what we've got basically, just quickly before the break yeah. comes, we've got basically... Uh, in Mesopotamia, we had these god kings that yep. were called the One, yep. who move out of Mesopotamia because of this terrible disease, yep. plague that comes yep. along. They, over 600 or so years, they end up in Scandinavia yep. and make Gotland, Godlands, yep. yep. where we then have this great rise in all these 
deities like Odin and yep. and we're going to get into that a little bit in the second half. Absolutely. So there's the basic outline of the God Kings come from Mesopotamia up through Europe into Scandinavia with a special bloodline and we have a particular reason why that bloodline is important. After the break we're going to get into the further story. <laughs> Welcome back to Gardener's World, where we're with Professor Hugh Montgomery talking about God Kings and uh, the bloodlines. Not necessarily the bloodline of Jesus, which, you know, fair enough, is partially interesting, isn't it, I suppose? If you want to be. This is much more in interesting because this is also is the line of Odin. Yep. I mean, most people, Odin is, is a god. And yep. this is a bloodline that you have, that is called the Ulvunga. Dynasty, the Ulvunga bloodline. What does that mean and what, why is it called that? Okay, the Ulvunga dynasty is a dynasty who descends from Atta Ulf of the Visigoths and Maria of the Elchocytes. Right. Now, Stop. Visigoths. Okay. Right. I told you that the Cassites had gone up to mm -hmm. Scandinavia where they became known as gods or goths. Yeah. Okay. Goths. Okay. They came down south later on into Europe where they split and became Ostrogoths and Visigoths. Now, I'm not convinced in my own mind yeah. that that particular division actually happened as we tend to think of it, tend to be two separate lines, because um, I suspect that that is a misunderstanding on the part of Roman writers who were basically writing about it. At and the they, end of the day, they didn't call themselves Visigoths. No, of course they didn't. You know. <laughs> no one so, says, hi, I'm a Visigoth. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> There could have been a slight sort well, of little shift, but either way, it, these let's, are, call it the, let's call them Goths. These are the descendants yeah. of the God Kings from Mesopotamia. Um, some of them. Some of them. I mean, well, certainly the leaders. Yes, almost certainly that there was part of the bloodline still going along because okay. we can prove that. And Atterhulf was of. And Atterhulf was of that line. And he was the leader of. Well, he was actually originally a king of Mercia. Okay. Okay and he became over king of a couple of other British kingdoms. Then his sister married Alaric of the Visigoths. Right. And one assumes, one doesn't know, but one assumes he went south with her to look after her, take her to her wedding, etc. And when he got there, he discovered that Alaric was about to go and sack Rome, and frankly, the, the uh, chance of plundering Rome was too good a chance to miss, so mm. he said, right, Come oh, on, boys. We'd have all jumped in there. Yeah, we'll yeah. all jump in yeah. and go and have a bit of blunder. <laughs> and what then happened, of course, is that Alaric died shortly afterwards, and Atulf was actually elected yeah. chief or king elected. of the Visigoths. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so he, he was married to Maria of the Elchizites. Well, Elch he was Maria. He had a lot of women. Okay. Maria of the Elchizites was going really on me more and more. Yes. <laughs> 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 he, he had a lot of women, right. uh, amongst them Gallia Placidia of the Roman Emperor, imperial family. Yes. But he also married, or at least um, um, got into bed with, um, Maria of the Elchocytes. Okay. Now, Maria of the Elchocytes claims descent from Jesus. Right, so you've got a union of Odin, the line of Odin, yep. and Jesus. Correct, yeah. Very powerful. Very powerful. <clears throat> and what then, let me explain why I think this happened. If you go back to the year 318, mm -hmm. a group of people known as the Dispersini, which are the descendants of Jesus and his brethren, mm -hmm. arrived in Rome to see a guy called Sylvester, yeah. who up to that point had merely been Bishop of Rome. But he got together with Constantine and got himself made Pontifax Maximus, a chief priest or Pope. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with Christianity, everything to do with the old Roman pagan religion. Mm -hmm. And basically, the deal that he'd done with Constantine was, um, we have to change the Christian religion. If I make this the only one and only religion of the Roman Empire, it's got to change, because I've got to sell this. Yeah to the Roman people. And the Roman people believe in gods having, you know, yeah. virgin mothers and, yeah. and, you know, you've got Zeus coming down yeah. to Europa in the form of a bull. So, so we know that the Christians in 380 yeah. kind of amalgamated everything together and found this thread yeah. and made it powerful and called it Christianity. Yeah. Which is an empirical Christianity. Yeah. So 
What, what, what happens with the Orvunga dynasty? Well, no, the Orvunga dynasty wasn't there yet. Right. What, it what, began with Maria and Atom. Yes, but Maria was, was, was quite long, it was a hundred years later. Right, okay. So, um, what happens is that um, basically the uh, dynasty, the Dispersini, the, the, the children and the children of, of his brothers and sisters of Jesus, got written out. Okay. At that meeting, where they, that meeting where they recreated okay. Christianity, yeah. they kicked out all the descendants of Jesus. The Pope actually turned around to them, and this is on record, mm. and said, you are being written out of the dogma of the church. From now on, only bishops created by Rome are valid. Prior to that, Jerusalem had been the, been, been the main bishopric. Right, so uh, just, just yeah. to get this clear for everybody, yeah. because this is, can be astounding stuff to a lot of people. In 318... They actually said, you, the descendants of Jesus, are being written out. Yes. Which implies that there were descendants of Jesus. Yes. Oh, yes. And we know okay. their names. And we know their names. Yep. Okay. Just um, get that clear. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then they had, um, then Constantine called the famous Council of Nicaea in 325. And then there was the most frightful kerfuffle, because all the Antonicene fathers who said, no, 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 come on, look, here's the genealogy of Jesus, he's got a twin brother. Um, you know, if Jesus mm. is divine, is his twin brother divine, mm. or his children divine? Um, so they blew that out as well? Well, Athanasius, who was, you know, paranoid schizophrenic, frankly, Perfect uh, got, up, got up and said, no, 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 it's all lies. Walter Nash, mm -hmm. um, you know, Jesus is divine, he's the one and only son of God, he never had any brothers and sisters, didn't have any children, he wasn't married. And uh, Sylvester said, yes, 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 absolutely agree with that, that's what we'll say. Okay. And, it's a very uh, good impression. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly, um, the discussion got to such a state that Constantine got fed up with us and said, right, he said, this is what it's going to be. It's called the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. I believe in God the Father Almighty, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And you either sign that if you're a bishop, or you're, you know you get your throat cut. Mm -hmm. So what? And a lot of the bishops escaped, but a lot of them signed. Okay, so that's preparation ground there. Yep. Hundred years or so later, Atahulf and Maria get together. Okay. Start this dynasty because we've got to get on to Utrera. Yeah. Okay. Right. <clears throat> then what happened is that the the dynasty of the Desper Sinai, let's call it at that point, yep. was pushed out. They were killed, they, were, they had to go into exile, change their names, etc., etc. They started using coded names and all the rest of it. And some of them came on side as well, did they? Yeah. And actually, from one of those who was theoretically a father of the church, right? but he had a daughter called Maria, mm -hmm. and he suddenly saw something changing. Rome was no longer the great big power. Mm -hmm. Who was the great big power? The Visigoths. Right. Marry my daughter to the king of the Visigoths, and guess what? I'm back my in power. I'm back in power. Yeah. And that's what he did. And from that, you get the Ulvungas. Right. And that dynasty finished up being rulers of all of Scandinavia, most of Europe, southern Italy, and eventually Palestine. So we've got some names that we can recognize in. In, from history. Yes. A lot of people that are watching this know about the Templars, they know about the Crusades, etc. Yep. Are there some names in there that well, will ring a bell? Where, where do you want to go to? To the Crusades? Utrema. Utrema. <laughs> right, you want to go to the Crusades. Right. Pope Urban preached the Crusade, didn't he? Yes, supposedly. Well, before he preached the Crusade, he went and talked to certain people. Right. Raymond of Toulouse, okay, Hugh, yeah. de, Hugh de Vermandois, and the Bishop of Le Puy. Each and every one of them was an Alvunga descendant. Curiouser and curiouser. Okay. So he said, let's go and capture Jerusalem. And the Alvungas sort of got together and thought, just a moment, we can go back and become kings over where we got thrown out of by the Romans. <laughs> so forget all the business about people's Using crusades. Roman power. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely! <laughs> Using the power of the papacy. Oh, how wonderful. That's ah, I love that. Irony. Yes, <laughs> irony. So, if you have a look at the leaders of the Crusades, Hugh de Vermandois, Raymond of Toulouse, Robert of Normandy, Bohemond of Taranto, um, Godfrey of Bouillon, yeah. each and every one, as I've shown in that book, was an Ulvunga. 
Okay. That's just way beyond coincidence, surely. That well, as I said, one is an accident, two is coincidence, <laughs> three, um, mm -hmm. it's enemy action, and when you've got five of them, yeah. it's pretty it's much, it, yeah, it's a plan. Mm. Okay? And they then went and eventually they took over Jerusalem. But before they even started off towards Antioch or Jerusalem, they went, or a, a group of them, mm -hmm. went and took Edessa. Yes, they split off, didn't they? And Edessa was probably the most important thing that they had to do. Because in Edessa was the library of King Abgar, who's supposed to have had correspondence with Jesus. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, you take over this library. And remember, you're still trying to fight a crusade, but yeah. this has to be protected against all odds. Yeah. And it was. I mean, the Atabag, uh, I forget what his name was, Khalid, um, tried to take Edessa from them. And it was defended, you know, and, and he was chucked out. Because people don't realise just how important bloodlines were. And still are, to yeah. a great many people. Yes. I mean, to the most of us yeah. Yeah, out there in the real world, it doesn't matter no, squat doesn't. about bloodlines. No. But to those people in power, in positions of power... It's, it's incredibly important. Yeah. Because if you it's marry back into it, you keep the land, you keep the titles, you keep the wealth, you keep the power. And so therefore, those documents of Abgar... Incredibly important. Because they could have proven, well, beyond all doubt, they could have proven up to the point that the people at that time would have accepted mm. that not only was there a bloodline from Jesus, but very possibly that there was even a letter from him to King Anka after his supposed death on the cross. Ooh. Now that would have been dangerous. That would have been like, ah. <clears throat> so what did the papacy say? As the papacy realised this might happen. Mm. So they said, ah, Jesus never wrote anything. Excuse me? Mm. A rabbi? A <laughs> learned man? He never wrote anything? This God King of theirs is now all of a sudden illiterate? Oh, come on. What a, you know, what yeah. a bunch of wallies. Yeah. Really? It's one after another. Well, absolutely. <laughs> and and this, is, this is the whole point. And, um, but if you've got this letter, mm. if you have this letter, just think of the power that it gives you. And my thought then was, okay, is there any proof that they got this letter? And the answer is, actually, no, there isn't. But there's some, what should we say, there's certain coincidences that take place which suggest that all of a sudden the new rulers in Jerusalem have got something that no one else ever had. Mm. Number one. The Patriarch of Jerusalem did not want to uh, crown Baldwin I as king. You know, if you remember Godfrey of Bouillon, yeah. who was only ever... Wouldn't take it, would he? No, he wouldn't take it, yeah. right? <clears throat> because he said um, he only would take um, keeper of the Holy Soul, protector of the Holy Sepulchre, yeah. it was called something like that. <clears throat> and the church was absolutely against having a king of Jerusalem. Baldwin arrives from Edessa, has a private interview with the Patriarch, and the Patriarch comes up and says, I will crown him tomorrow. A oh, come on. Mm -hmm. What made him change his mind? Yeah. Something. A document? Mm. Maybe. But even more important, in 1119, just after they had founded the Order of the Temples, particular pope was elected. He was called Calixtus II. Mm. And guess what? He's no longer. <laughs> you couldn't now, write this. You couldn't. Well, Dan Brown might, but... Yeah, you know, but, I mean, you, you actually can't... It, it is almost... It's like... Oh, my God. Mm. So, here we are saying that we're back in power, boys, and guess what? You're going to be pope. Um, anyone disagree? No. There's this letter here we've got. You better all shut up. Mm. <laughs> Otherwise, or, we'll, or we'll show the Daily Sun. Yes, yes. yes. yes exactly. Or worse than that. <laughs> you know, come on. I mean, it's and, just and by, too... that, by that period, you've basically got all of Europe is Catholic. 
Theoretically. Theoretically. Yeah, I mean, a lot, an awful a lot, lot of them paid lip know, service. Yes, I don't know, but. no, no, but an awful lot of them were still Aryans. OK, so you've got most of Europe Catholic. Yeah, yeah. You've got major power base. Yeah. That's major. Land, yeah. money, yeah. Yeah. income, yeah. you name it. Somebody gets over there, these other mm. guys, get over there, find a bit of paperwork, mm. which they can then bribe the most powerful mm. organisation on the planet. They've used that organisation to get what they needed. Yep. We've been very clever. You, yep. the irony is incredible here. Yeah. I mean, if you want a conspiracy theory, you know, just the, it is, you couldn't write a conspiracy theory Did, that was even... I mean, from anywhere near this. This has come from you going after facts. It hasn't you? Haven't you? Didn't think about this before, did you? I, I hadn't got a clue about it until you were just I, simply tracing genealogy. That's all I was doing, and all of this came to light. Yeah, I mean, I had to go and look for documents. And I, I, I couldn't have done it without the internet. Mm. I have to say that because um, I can Google things in and find out where documents are. Yeah. Once you find out where the documents are, then you can go and look for them. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've had a very, very similar thing. This is, this is what a lot of researchers need to remember, mm. is, is the internet is, is a great place, but there's an awful lot of stuff that's just made up on there, too. Oh, absolutely. Um, so you've got to go for the original documentation. Yep. I did the same thing with the bond cone, where I, yep. I went to the university in Houston and actually found it. But if I hadn't had Google, I wouldn't have known where that piece of paper was. Absolutely. So, yep. yeah, it's, it's very, very useful. So, after the break, we're going to get deeper into these Godkins of Uchimur, because I know there's a lot more to talk about especially with regard to the Knights Templar, um, which I know a lot of people that are watching will be interested in. So join us after the break. Hello there, welcome back to Gardener's World, where I'm joined by Professor Hugh Montgomery, and we're talking about God Kings. Uh, before the break, we were talking about the sources. Really, and one of the one of the amazing things that I, that I've found since I've known you is is the, the paperwork that you've got. I I didn't no idea some of that existed, and I know for a fact that there are certain people in Hollywood that would love to get their hands on <laughs> certain pieces of paper that you've got, yes. and there are various other authors, authors which um, ask you to use them and have used them in their own work, etc. I mean, what's yeah. some of these sources that you've right. managed to find? Well. One of the most important documents is called the Abdias Manuscript. Although its full title is The True Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> uh, whether that's to differentiate it from the other ones or not, I'm not sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <clears throat> it was written by a guy called Abdias, who was the Judaic Christian uh, Bishop of Babylon. Um, he, he, it says in the prologue to it, that he was related to the Lord. Unfortunately, it doesn't say how he was related. Oh, I wish it Lord? did. <laughs> well, you're talking about Jesus. We're implying Jesus. Yeah, yeah we're okay. implying Jesus. What it does give, however, is the fact that Jesus had a twin brother called Judas, known as Judas Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, he had... And does he get confused in the Bible as to being a separate person? Um, Possibly. He certainly gets confused occasionally in the Acts of Thomas, because in one of the places in the Acts of Thomas, he, um, Jesus actually has to turn around and said, no, I am not my twin brother Judas, I am Jesus. Right. <laughs> so, clarify that. Clarifying that one. Okay. Right. Um, so he had a twin brother. He also had um, a full brother called James, or Jacob. Mm. And then, of course, his, his father had a second wife called Hannah, and by her, he had Simon, known as Simon Hananias, uh, another Judas, or Judah, known as Zelotes, and a guy called Tadeus. Mm. And so we have a perfectly normal Jewish oh, family. Yeah. Um, they were all polygamous, so, you know, his grandfather had two wives, his father had two wives, he had two wives. And Jesus, of course, is a, a rabbi, supposedly. So. He would have Well, the, the fact of the matter is that if you look at Torah, and, and Deuteronomy is almost the same, it actually says that certain people cannot be named or numbered amongst the people of Israel as um, adults mm. unless they can prove that they are men. And the only way you could do that was by fathering a child. Yeah. So, um, because if you couldn't father a child, guess what? Mm -hmm. You were chucked out. So, I mean, 
you know, there is no question in my mind. And the Abdias document actually yep. points certain things out about him anyway, doesn't it? Yes, yes. It makes, it makes very clear that he was, you know, it actually says that, that Joseph and Mary um, created their children per column, mm. by way of the flesh. Mm. Well, then no virgin birth and, and no, um, yeah. you know, um, resurrection or anything like so that. So how did this, this document survive? Uh, you know, well, surely the Christian Church, the Catholic Church, wouldn't have wanted that document around. Well, it survived amongst Nolunga. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who happened to be? Who happened to be a Habsburg emperor? Uh, right. Right. And this is where the original uh, manuscript finished up in the in the um, hands of the Habsburg imperial family. And from there, it was copied in 15 something or other and printed for the first time. <laughs> so a document which casts Jesus as an ordinary guy having yeah. kids yeah. and a twin yeah. is kept by Ulvunga dynasty people yes. who then at the right time at the time when it's okay to do so, or, or you know, I mean, because that's a that's it's that's a just about a turning point. Exactly, isn't it? it's about the turning know, people point. People are pinning things yes, to doors exactly. and all kinds of things. Yes, it's about that time. You yeah. See. So there's a kind of new enlightenment now, coming at uh, that point. Theoretically, this is the, the the most powerful Catholic monarch. You know, this is the imperial family. More irony. Um. Well, the fact of the matter is that the popes used to think that they were terribly, terribly Catholic. But um, one of the Habsburg emperors did turn around and said, well, actually, I just regard the Pope as my private chaplain. <laughs> Enough said. Yes, take yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they did definitely, by that period, see themselves as extremely powerful, and they had done, I oh, mean, Godfrey I thought yes. he was extremely yeah. powerful anyway. I mean, yeah. when you read about that guy, so. Yeah. The, these are people that see themselves as being incredibly powerful anyway. Absolutely. Playing some vast game, all relating around this bloodline. Yes. Using the Jesus thing occasionally to... Well, I mean, one of, the problems on the about the, one of the problems, for example, about the Habsburgs is this damn lip. You know the famous Habsburg lip, they call it? Was yeah. it actually a chin? Yeah. Guess what? Um, it's an Ulvunga trait. It, and certain <laughs> families in the Ulvungas, because it got... It got you know, they used to intermarry to such an extent yeah. that, that this is what happened. And for example, one of the kings, uh, one of the Bourbon kings, I think it was, mm. called uh, one the Bewitched. Was he called one the Bewitched? Something the Bewitch, anyway. And, um, I mean, he was so interbred that he couldn't speak anymore. His tongue stuck out and he's, you know, I mean, he was just a complete mess. This is how important it was, though. Yes. To keep that bloodline, you know. But, you know, and, and one of the worst things was the marriage of uncles to nieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was just went on all the time. That's just, you can't even contemplate that kind yeah. of nonsense. But getting back to Outremer, yeah. where we've got this plan yeah. in place. They, they've taken Jerusalem mm -hmm. in, the, in the First Crusade. Yep. They've taken various other points as well. Antioch, Edessa. Yeah. Uh, and various points east, yes. They've possibly got this text, yep. which they've used to yep. stitch one on the, the, yep. the Pope. But, you know, at this period, we've got rising this famous Knights Templar. How, does, does this come into the history of it at all? Well, yes and no. Um, first and foremost, <clears throat> if you go and look at the internet, and I point this out in my book, there's so-called Nine Knights, yeah. right? The only person who actually um, mentions them was writing about 70 years later, I think. And he actually only mentions two. Ugos Paganos, which is usually translated as Hugh de Payen, mm -hmm. and André Montpardis, Translated is André de Montbard. Mm -hmm. None of the others are ever mentioned anywhere in any document. Until much later. Until much later. However, if you have a look at the names of some of the others, and I'd have to actually look in my book there to, to pick out the names, 
at least one or two, possibly three, can be found as in the private bodyguard of either Baldwin the first or Baldwin the second. Right. Both of whom started life as Counts of Edessa, both of whom became kings of Jerusalem. And both Ulvunga. And both Ulvunga. So, Ulvunga, what's the implication here? Well, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I, I see the Knights Templars as being <coughs> simply the personal, uh, starting off as the personal bodyguard of the kings of Jerusalem. Mm. Um, however, because certainly the Baldwins uh, were in contact with the, for example, the Egyptian Fatimids, yeah. which would have been against um, what a lot of the, <coughs> what should we call it, peasant crusaders, yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, it would be totally against what they thought, yeah. because they were all fervent Catholics, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he probably wanted a very special bodyguard who could take personal messages for mm. him with trust. Yes, ones who could keep secret. One who could keep secrets. Um, and so later on we get all this concept of the Knights Templars keeping secrets. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. And those secrets could possibly be well, uh, these certain, texts that they were found yeah. in Edessa. Very possibly. Maybe they, 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 for example, I mean, I don't think they went and dug themselves under the temple. It would have been far below them to go around digging. But mm -hmm. they might have had a, an army of labourers who, who did some digging there and, and their job was to act as policemen and anything that came up, right, I'll have that, thank you very yes. much, mate. Yeah. And, you know, put it in the box somewhere. Mm. Because the other thing that was very powerful, not just the bloodline stuff, another thing that's very powerful is relics. You know, Constantine's mother, she was, uh, you know, Hell famous oh for um, yeah, I know. finding she chicken found, bones. Let me see, what <laughs> she found? She found the tree on which Jesus was, was supposed, the cross on which Jesus died, except it was mm -hmm. a living tree and it was green, so she cut it down and divided it into four. Uh, the nails of the cross, yeah. um, the uh, three wise men. Yeah. And, and from then on, reliquary <sighs> has been... You yeah. know, and we see it as stupid. We may walk into a, a church in Spain or somewhere right. and see a little bo reliquary box with a chicken bone in saying this is the... Thumb bone of someone, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and, and we just can't laugh, you know, how yep. ridiculous is that? Um, but we forget, uh, historically at the period, how powerful that was a mani mind manipulation. It still is. Yeah. It still oh, is. Oh, it is to a billion Catholics around the world. Oh, it is. To me and you, though, yeah, yes, it's nonsense. I know. So people don't really yeah. realise just how, in our yeah. nation, how powerful yeah. a relic can yeah. be. I mean, one of the other interesting relics, which theoretically was in Odessa anyway, <clears throat> was, mm. it became known as the Holy Mandilion, and it was supposed to be the uh, face of Jesus on a cloth. Mm. Now, according, to, according to the documents that came out of Edessa, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was painted by the court painter from real life. Um, I suppose that it would, well, to me it would make sense because it was painted on a sort of um, cloth of some sort or other. Mm -hmm. They didn't have canvas per se in those days, I don't think. So, um, it was painted on a cloth which presumably would have been then sort of stretched over something so you could paint it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that was a precious relic that they had. Now, in 300 and something, although I can't remember the exact date, one of the Eastern emperors supposedly robbed that and took it back to Constantinople. My question would be, <clears throat> would they be stupid enough to give up the original? Mm. Or were there a lot of copies were made and, yes, sir, that's the original. Mm. There, are, there are an awful lot of instances of the Mandalian. The, 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 it's there, it's there, yeah, it's there. exactly. So that would make complete yeah. sense that, that it's so all over the place. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. And therefore, if they also found that, that would have gone back to Jerusalem mm -hmm. and then would have probably, once Jerusalem was, in the, was about to fall, yeah. it would have been taken out together yeah. with lots of other documents. And we know, for example, that I think it's in the year 1152, but I'd have to check on that, the exact date. <clears throat> there is an entry in the Chancellery of Jerusalem which, for a wooden box lined with oil silk, bound with iron and with sail cloth covers, 
which suggests to me that this box was going to be transporting something. Very precious. Something which could deteriorate. In other words, it wasn't gold or something of that sort, otherwise you wouldn't line it with oil silk. No. Right? And that that was then transported to Europe because it would have the reason for having all this was presumably protected from a sea journey. Mm. So but I've got no idea what was in it. I don't know how many boxes there were. We don't know how big the box was, whether it was this size or that yeah. size or whatever. Yeah. No idea. But there is this one description there, which is interesting. Yes, it is. I mean, it's, it's almost like the shroud of the terrain, you know, which, which did fall into a certain family hands, didn't it? Well, um, it, it is very possible that at some stage or other, one of the kings of Jerusalem decided to give it to the Knights Templars. And from there it passed into the family of, um, I forget now who, who owned it, and, and thereafter became the Shroud of Turin. I mean, it's a possibility, mm. but I don't know. It, that is, that's, that's speculation. Yeah, it? it's, well, what isn't speculation is the work that you've done, the facts that you've yeah. uncovered, the, yeah. the, the incredible amount of textual evidence which are, are in all three of your books, yeah. um, and which I know that a lot of other researchers in this field use as, as a reference. Um, some tool, of them, some of them attempt to use it. Yeah. Um, one of them, only one, actually has ever seen any of the documents prior to, yeah. to my publishing that anyway, and that was Michael Bajant. And he actually mentions this in one, mm. one of his books. Um, others have... Well, a lot of people use your books. Oh, yes. They use your books as reference. Yes. Because you've done the hard work. Yes. So it's easy to go to your book and find yeah. it. So, you know, it, that, that in itself is, 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 a, is a work that's worthy because it's helping yeah. other people. Um, you've done a lot of leg, leg work for them. Yeah. So there's a lot of facts and things in there. How do people find out any more about you? How would they contact you, for instance, for conferences and things? Uh, then they would go to um, www.nucleusagency.com, okay. which are my agents, and um, contact them and they would do the... Um, because you're, you're up for speaking, you do lectures, um, and, and very good lectures as well, because you're a professional. So, um, yeah. That's, that's right. what's, what's coming up soon. You've got a film coming out, I know that, because yes. we just made it. So yes. if anybody wants to see um, any more of this, there's a film out probably now um, when you see this. It's called God Kings, and it will be available on Amazon and yep. all other places. And that goes into yep. very visual stuff. So thank you very much, you for coming on the show. I'm honoured yet again, sir. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> so I, right. I, I do hope you've enjoyed that and that you'll join me again on Gardener's World. And there are more information on gardenersworld.com if you want to find out about any of my guests. So, see you again soon.